APJ listeners, hello. Welcome to this special episode, an update from Pastor John's life and ministry, and a little summary of all our labors at DesiringGod.org. As some of you know, our ministry year runs July 1st to June 30th, so we close out fiscal year 2020 and enter into fiscal year 2021 in just a few days. And of course, we are fully supported by God's people, listeners like you. So this episode is also a big thank you to all of our partners, and we'd love for more of you to join us, and I'll explain how in just a little bit. It's been an incredible year for this podcast as we near episode 1500. That's unreal to me. That episode, episode 1500, should drop in mid-July, and when it does, we will take some time to talk more about APJ and to explore some of the productivity takeaways of Pastor John's ministry as we uh, approach the 8th anniversary of Ask Pastor John. Wow. More broadly, when you look at uh, all the resources at DesiringGod.org, the books, the articles, the podcasts, the look at the book videos, when you combine the reach of them all, we've seen about 200 million resource views across all of our platforms this fiscal year. Those numbers are staggering as well. And of course, most recently, the Coronavirus and Christ book has seen over a million downloads globally and is being made freely available in almost 30 different languages now. It's been a crazy spring for everyone, but here in this transition, as we close off one year and uh, look ahead to the next year ahead, I wanted to take a moment to ask you, Pastor John, about our past year. Uh, But first, I would love a personal update. What has life been like for, for you during this pandemic, and now especially with the protests and the riots happening Uh, just within blocks of your home in Minneapolis. Right. Well, the most important thing to say about what has happened here in Minneapolis in the last week, and I know this is being played a couple weeks later than we're recording it, in the last week, that is about a week since uh, the death of George Floyd, what the most important thing to say, I believe, is that the authority and holiness of God was defied by a policeman who put his knee on a man's neck for seven minutes until he died, ignoring all legitimate pleas that he was sufficiently subdued and dying. That's the main reality of this moment Mm. here in Minneapolis. And of course, the burning and the looting of hundreds of businesses about a mile from my house down on Lake Street is also defiance against the authority and the holiness of God. And as I've been pondering these things, my thoughts about the wars on the streets and the hundreds of fires and the looting and the coronavirus, what presses in on me is that there's a war beneath the wars and there's a looting beneath the looting, and there's a virus beneath the virus. Everything is deeper. Nothing is merely what you see. James asks, what causes wars and fightings among you? Is it not that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. In other words, beneath the wars of knees on necks and wars of reprisal in the war of of, uh, looting, there's a war of soul going on with murderous effects of unsatisfied desires, James 4, 1. And underneath the looting, there's another looting, the looting of heaven. We have stolen God's honor, robbed him of glory 10,000 times. And beneath the coronavirus is an unfathomably, oh, have I been impressed with the power of sin, unfathomable power and deadly virus of God belittling sin. It is absolutely resistant to every cure but the blood of Jesus So that's where my mind has been, Tony, in in these days. The war beneath the war, the looting beneath the looting, the virus beneath the virus. And what is our calling? What is the calling of desiring God? You might say that the coronavirus has created the kind of solitude for me, and the street wars have created the kind of urgency in my mind and Mm. heart that blows away the fog of 
worldliness and confusion and brings a good deal of clarity to what life is really for. Even 74-year-old John Piper life. Hmm. You know, we've had to cancel all our travels uh, in recent months and and indefinitely into the future and turn all our regular meetings into Zoom meetings. But this has been very clarifying for me because it has confirmed something God was doing, a stirring in my own heart that focusing on the study and the teaching of God's Word through look at the book, at Desiring God, through look at the book, should be a higher priority for me in these next years, if God gives me years, than travel should. Look at the book feels to me increasingly like the kind of legacy that I want to leave. Namely, look, look with me. World, look, look at God's word with me. Come, let's walk together among the riches of Ephesians. Nothing in these days of police brutality and rioting and coronavirus is more important than actually seeing the reality of God in Christ, in his word, and submitting to it in all of its detail and its radical, radical difference from the pathways of sin. So, every minute that I am granted by the limitations put on me now by coronavirus, every minute that I'm granted that I wouldn't have been granted, I'm pressing in on a life goal of opening all of Paul's letters with look at the book. Amazing. Multi-year project ahead. Right. It could be, I mean, realistically, and unless I do nothing else, yeah. like 50 hours a week, <laughs> it, it's probably a 10-year project, but that puts me at yep. uh, 84, whether I'll I'll be functioning at 84, God knows. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. And we're talking about, look at the book, the, your video series of you drawing on the text. I'm sure a lot of listeners are familiar with. Um, give us some uh, reflections on the coronavirus book now. It's been translated all over the world. Uh, wh- what are your takeaways as you look back now on that book project and uh, any lessons that you're taking away from that? The emergence of the coronavirus and Christ book are really stunning as I look back on them. They're almost like a dream how that happened. I mean, we were in a, you were there, we were in a leadership team meeting and praying, thinking, should we say anything? Should we do anything? Should we create a website? Should we, what should we do? And, and, and somebody, I think it was Scott said, maybe, maybe you should, you should tweak uh, your uh, hospital book, you know, how to, how to not waste your suffering, how to not waste your hospital stay, tweak that and how to not waste your coronavirus or something. So I I went home and started to write and <laughs> hundred pages later <laughs> it was not a tweak. It was not a tweak anymore. It yeah. was it was a burden that just fell out of my heart. It took four days to write that book. And then the team just jumped on it right away, edited it within 24 hours, crossway, blessed their hearts, almost dropped everything, turned it into a, a book, turned it around in a matter of days. And the, the heart of Crossway with us is so wonderful because they're so ready with us to say, okay, let's give away the electronic copy. Let's give away the audio book. I'd never recorded a book before and somebody, I forget who suggested that. Let's do that. So you and I, you know, with our electronic possibilities yep. here, we recorded the book. And so the book is free in recording. The book is free in electronic. And then, and then you can buy a, a hard copy. And then Rick Denham our partner in international relations jumps on it, and what? We've got close to 30 translators yeah. recruited from all over the world Amazing. to uh, turn, turn the translation around in a matter of weeks. And uh, I, think, I think we're pushing 30, not quite, but yep. all of that was absolutely stunning to me. And my, my prayer for the book, if somebody were to say, what's it, what's it about? What, what are you trying to do with that book? I would say my goal is for the church and the world in reading the book, to be brought to a fresh, or maybe a first time, repentance, meaning the reordering. I don't, when I say repentance, I don't mainly feel bad about what you've done in the past. That, that's, that's part of it. It's not the main part, though. Repentance, metanoia, is an 
a mind that gets turned around like 180 degrees from belittling or ignoring or neglecting Jesus and now bringing all of your thinking, all of your feeling, all of your acting into alignment with the infinite value of Jesus Christ. And a key text there would be Philippians 3, 8, where Paul says, I count everything as loss because of the infinite value of knowing Jesus. And so I just think one of the effects of threats to our life and our world should be Jesus is really precious, yeah. really, really precious. That's good. Props to Scotty Anderson for igniting that book project that launched what became Amen. an all hands on deck DG project right. uh, with Crossway. It was amazing. Speaking of books, we're recording this episode early because you've got to get off to vacation and then off to book writing because the summer months are when you normally write your your big books, your new big books, and you're planning to do so again this summer. Can you give us a preview of what's on your mind and your heart? Like, what's, what's going to be the next book project for John Piper? Right. For several years, I have longed to write a book, not a huge one, I hope a manageable one, uh, but, but rigorous on the nature of saving faith. And when I say nature of saving faith, I don't mean anything too philosophical. I mean, I mean, what is it actually like in the soul? in the mind, in the affections? What is it like to have or exercise saving faith? Uh, Specifically, I'm a Christian hedonist. I want to know more precisely and express helpfully for others how the uh, affectional dimension of our lives relates to this act of faith. What's, for example, what's the relationship between trusting God and loving God? And a key text there is going to be 1 John 5, 2 through 5, where John is just amazing in the way he relates love for God and faith in God. You know, I've, I've always, goodness, ever since I wrote uh, Faith in Future Grace, I've always defined saving faith as being satisfied with all that God is for you in Jesus. Now, that's a pretty controversial definition because it foregrounds the affectional dimension of our hearts called being satisfied. And I based that on John 6, 35. And uh, what I'm going to do is in this book is test that. I'm going to do a more uh, thoroughgoing, rigorous, uh, across the Bible and mainly New Testament effort to ask, okay, Piper, you've been talking that way for a long time. You got any other verses? Like, <laughs> is, this, is this your weird, eccentric way of talking about saving faith, or does the Bible as a whole really warrant that? You know, another way to say it would be, when you read John 1, 11 and 12, he came to his own, Jesus came to his own, and his own people did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, comma, who believed in his name, comma, so you can see how receiving and believing are being treated as as a parallel there and explaining each other, to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. Now, my question is, receive him as what? Receive him how? If you receive him as Savior, what is that soul experience like? If you receive him as Lord, what is that soul experience like? If you receive him as treasure, what is that soul experience like? And you can see right off the bat that the word receive there, which is right at the heart of the essence of what faith is, is not obvious when it relates to different objects or Christ viewed through different lenses Hmm. as Savior or Lord or treasure or other ways. So that's, that's the gist of what I'm after in, in the book, and I would love for people to, to pray for me. That'll be what? When is that going to happen? July? Uh-huh. July or August? August I, I think we set aside about seven or eight weeks to work on yeah. that. So pray that, that I could get it done and that it would, of course, be as faithful to Scripture as possible. Yeah, big task ahead. We'll be praying for you, obviously, as a DG team and absolutely APJ listeners. We would love for you to Thank chime you. in and to pray. And uh, let's not forget, you have a big book on Providence that's coming out mm. in January. Uh, any thoughts on that as you look forward to that launch? That's a pretty significant project. I, I have in my left hand at this very moment 
the color comps, as they call them, for the book huh. and asking me, how do you like this color for the cover? Yeah. And so Crossway, did, they're so gracious to work with us at Desiring yeah. God to, to take our our sense of things into account. So that's where we are. The the layout of the book, the tight setting and the, the copy editing are going on right now. We're pretty far along. It will, it will be in its fixed form within a matter of weeks, probably. It's a very big book. It's a book I have dreamed of writing and, and finished last summer. It's a book that I had hoped I could write for years, and, and God finally gave mm -hmm. me the two summers in a row yeah. to devote to writing it in a sense i would say it's the it's the foundation and the sum of all i have ever taught it seeks to be uh, biblical throughout rather than mainly philosophical which i think sets it off from good many other books on providence uh, it addresses the goal of providence the nature of providence the extent of providence and if if people wonder uh, what do you mean i mean what, what's the difference why didn't you call it the sovereignty book yeah. instead of the providence book and and the answer is that sovereignty in my understanding is the right and the power of god to do all he pleases but providence is purposeful sovereignty providence brings into the observation and the discussion, why is he doing what he's doing? If, in fact, he governs the fall of every sparrow in the world. My, my wife loves to do bird watching and put up feeders outside, and we, we watch these sparrows and wrens by the truckload, and she tries huh. to get rid of them <laughs> so to, get, to get a bird of color here, you know, something blue and red and yellow. But every one of those, there's a bazillion of them all over the world, and not one of them, Jesus says, falls to the ground apart from our Father. If that's true, what's he doing? What's God doing? If he decides that a bird drops down in uh, some dark jungle today in Papua New Guinea, and it falls to the ground, what was the point of that? There is a point. Mm. God never acts whimsically, ever. He does what he does for all wise reasons. And so providence poses that question. In a sense, this book will provide the biggest, most extensive rationale for the existence of Desiring God, because Desiring God and I exist to make the truth plain and powerful that God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. If you, if you say, where is the world, where is the universe going in the exercise of all God's sovereign providences, the answer is He's going to be glorified in His bride's satisfaction mm. in Him. Mm, that's the conclusion. I love it. It's a great book. I've read it, but I can't wait to hold it in my hands. Thank you, Pastor John, Thanks. for all of those updates. Yeah. Thank you. My pleasure. Appreciate your partnership and everybody's partnership out there that makes possible what we do here. We love our work and we love those who make it possible. Amen. We sure do. And that is no overstatement. All the strategic book projects, this podcast, everything we do at DesiringGod.org, all of it exists because we have generous ministry partners who pray for us regularly, and who pitch in to donate to fund all of our labors. We especially feel your support in seasons like this one when the ministry opportunities and the spiritual needs seem particularly huge and demanding. We've been able to meet some of these needs because we have you at our side, even during a global pandemic and even through national social upheaval. When the time is right to spend more money than normal, on gospel mission. If you are already a ministry partner with us, we love you and we thank God for you. Thank you for your prayers and for helping to make this past year possible and the year ahead possible as well. And we would love for more of you to join us in this work. You can join us, say, monthly for as little as $10 a month, and that would help make it possible for us to continue our labors and to expand our ministry outreach into the new ministry year, which again begins July 1st. Well, what does the Lord have in store for us in the year ahead? I'm almost afraid to ask, to be honest, but I'm sure there will be a lot more work to be done. You will be with us, and most important of all, God's presence will be with us for whatever is ahead. To join us and to make a gift today, visit DesiringGod.org forward slash donate. That's DesiringGod.org forward slash donate. 
As always, I am your host, Tony Ranke. Thank you for partnering with us. We'll see you next time.